<laughs> so anyway, so he says to Ahasuerus, there's a certain people. In English, it's there's a certain people. It, it, doesn't, get, it doesn't get it, but I'll come back to the meaning of it. And they're scattered and separate among all the peoples of the world, among all the provinces of your kingdom. And their laws differ from those of every other people, and they do not keep the, keep the king's laws. It's therefore of no use for the king to let them be, to keep them. If it pleases the king, this is chapter 3, verse 8, now in verse 9, if it pleases the king, let it be written to destroy them, and I will weigh out 10,000 silver talents, in other words, bullions, silver loaves, into the hands of those who perform the work, to bring it to the king's treasuries. So, again, these two verses are going to be very important for our class tonight. The main thing in the first verse is Yeshno Am Echad Mifuzar U Mifurad. And even just the first three words, Yeshno Am Echad. And even the first two words, Yeshno Am. And even the first word, Yeshno. Because Yeshno means there is. It's a strange, maybe, you know, like way of saying it, because we say in modern Hebrew, Yesh. But really, grammatically, Yeshno is still Hebrew still modern Hebrew. Yet there is. But the rabbis saw deeply into this because we see that the same root is shared with the word lishon, to sleep. Yoshen, to sleep. Yeshno. So the, oh, but again, most of this book, most of this green book is devoted in, in, in different ways and comes back full circle to the meaning of Haman's statement, according to the Midrash and the Kabbalah, their God is sleeping. We can get them. We can get them. We just have to keep them from doing mitzvot, and then their God will misdelek, his influence will be re removed from them, and they'll be sitting ducks. We can get them. And the whole meaning of we can get them is that they're, they are they are carriers of a certain idea on the planet, these Jews. We can remove them and remove that idea and we can take control. As long as that idea, that God idea exists, Nimrod, for instance, felt Abraham is a threat because Abraham represents the God idea. Him, Nimrod says, I'm God. Abraham says, you're not God, you're a nothing. There's a God, there's a real God. So Nimrod has to kill Abraham. He has to try. So same here. The Hitlers of the world always have to kill off the guy who's the carrier of the guy idea. Or means that he's, in other words, he's impelled from inside. He can't exist as long as we exist. And in, in truth, ultimately, though, he brings, his own, he brings about his own demise because you cannot kill the God idea. And we have to make sure that the God idea stays alive. We have to live for it and die for it if necessary so that the Hamans of the world can never take over. So he makes it into a real drama where we have to be part of this thing, where our lives come into actual danger because of these characters. They're part of God's plan, but I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. So Yeshno, as I go into it here, but uh, that's all I want right now. I should give you the, the, the power of the Midrashic reading of it, though. Yeshno Amechad. That very one, that very Echad, concerning whom it is written, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, that Echad, that God, that one God, Yeshno, he's sleeping. He's completely oblivious to his people. Again, the word Yeshno means there is but it contains a subtle hint of the word Yashen, he sleeps. The Holy One, blessed be he, said in response, Do you really think that I sleep? I.e. that a time exists when my unceasing providence over all creation is suspended. Behold, I may seem that I'm not looking. I create the impression that I'm not looking for my reasons. But uh-uh, behold, I never sleep. As the verse says, Hine lo yanum velo yishan. Shoma Yisrael. Behold, the guardian of Israel never sleeps nor slumbers. By your life, he says to Haman, of course, that Haman can't hear it, from the midst of sleep, I will arouse myself against you and destroy you. 
As the verse states, on that night, the king's sleep was disturbed. <coughs> the Midrash catches the double meaning of this verse. It refers both to the sleep of the human king, Ahasuerus, as well as to the apparent sleep of the infinite God. So I go, I go quite deeply into this Midrashic stuff. Stuff, right. Hi. <laughs> So meaning to say, I go, I don't let it go. It goes, it goes on, and I come back to it after pages, and I, because it's, it seems to be to me a, like a really important point. And um, and I get into this deeper thing that the Ali talks about that there's different levels of godly or divine providence. The two main levels of divine providence are called Zer Anpin and Arich Anpin. There's only one God, but He interacts with us. I think I said it on Shabbat or Sunday. Sometimes it gets blurred. As He interacts with us either sometimes as a parent or sometimes as a grandparent. And there are two different. The grandparent is the white, long white beard, and is very loving grandma and grandpa, and almost like totally unconditional love towards his, towards their grandchildren. They don't have to worry anymore at that level of grandma and grandpa about what the kids do, because really everything's okay. It doesn't matter. Come on, get close to me. I love you. I love you. And my grandchildren. Mommy and Daddy, why did you dirty your room? Why did you pick up your toys? Why did you wash your face? Would you please brush your teeth? Right? Boundaries. Right? Definitions. Um, imposed, enforced, imp enforced boundaries in order that the child should become responsible, accountable, and grown up and mature. Like otherwise, we're not doing our kids any other any favor. So Zeranpin is one type of mode of providence that God uses. And Arihanpin, uh, Zeranpin is considered somehow connected to what's called the heart center, to Veris. And Arihanpin, the long-faced one, is connected to Keter. The, even the word Zeir means young or small or diminished. It means almost that Hashem limits his great love, comes down from Arich, which is long, magnanimous, fully loving, and there's no, ad, no admixture of judgment up there, into a judgmental relationship with us, where we have to do certain things to earn his, earn his love. Again, it's coming from love. This is a subset within this. Like this Zeranthin is a subset within the great love of the Creator, to create a world where what we do means something. Well, what we do has consequences and has, re and, right? So it's not as if it's like that God is angry at us. It's a subset within this great love where he says, I need to interact with you in a way that you can know that what you do means, uh, has consequences. And, and, and uh, if, I would do you, if I would deal with you from up here, I would, again, I, I wouldn't be doing you any favors. So... To cut, to, the, to cut without explaining a lot of things, and it could be that I'll have to come in and explain more, but to cut to the chase, this aspect of God's providence is what is asleep at the time in Persia, at the time of the 